I'd like to discuss a few things about Sunday School, and it's, it's more to let you know um, what I'm trying to do and what help I would like, uh, especially, uh, and why I'm doing it. So firstly, I'd like to talk about the fact that teaching Sunday School is actually a ministry. So it's um, a way of uh, getting the message of God out there to people and even grown-ups through their children and remembering that our children are the grown-ups of the future. Um, I'd like to discuss the skills and requirements of different age groups because quite often people run into problems with uh, lessons that are not age appropriate so I'd like to talk about that a little bit. Uh, the scope and content of designing a multi-level curriculum because when I started it I thought oh this is a good idea I'll knock this over in a couple of months and that was about 1998 and I'm still doing it so it's uh, and I understand now that it is always going to be a work in progress so it's never going to be something that I finish it's something that's going to keep changing as we go on that we keep improving on and we keep adding to and expanding um, I'd also like to talk a little bit about the properties of an ideal lesson and uh, I'd say of all the lessons I've designed so far there would be less than 1% that have all the properties in there. I do have a few, but it's um, actually very hard to make them uh, exactly how we would really like them. Uh, and I, I have got, I've got sample lessons at each level, but I haven't got any with me, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get people to email me their interest in particular levels, because I think that'll work better. I had no idea how many people were going to be here or which, what lessons you needed, so um, it ended up being far too hard. Uh, and then there's a few challenges and areas for development that we've got that we need to talk about and probably that the, the uh, fellowship needs to talk about as a whole, uh, probably at the pastor level. So what is Sunday School? Sunday School, as I said, is a ministry with a vision. It's also an outreach. Um, you can do, actually do a lot of outreaching through Sunday School and some of the lessons we have, especially when I hold things like treasure hunts and bear hunts, um, if I give them notice that they're coming, they bring their friends. So we've actually had, and sometimes when their friends come, the parents come as well. So you can use Sunday School as an outreach. Um, Sunday School is the word faithfully taught to tomorrow's assembly. And that's one thing that you need to keep in mind, that the children that are in Sunday School now are the people that are going to be handing communion and giving the talks in a, not that many years hence. It's also an essential disciple-making strategy. So if you want that are gung-ho for the Lord and that um, are really on fire to spread his message, then they need to learn the basics somewhere. And a lot of the talks we have, if you think about it, you listening to one of the talks we had when you were nine or 10, it would go straight over your head. So they've got to learn the basics somewhere to be able to understand those talks. So it's very important that we remember that Sunday school is where they learn the basics so that they can understand where to find scriptures in their Bible, for example, and uh, also the, the fact that, you know, Jesus died for us, all those things that are accepted when you get into the talk because we know that that happens. And it is a forum for also giving our children a vision. So to get them enthused about carrying on into the future um, with the work of the Lord. Um, just a little bit more about teaching Sunday School as a ministry. Uh, we need to remind teachers uh, of the simplicity of the gospel message. That's actually something that's quite hard to get across. Children don't understand very complex issues straight off. You need to make things simple for them. And quite often I have teachers coming to me and say, I've never actually thought of that that way before. I thought it was far more complex than that, but it's not, is it? Some of the messages that we give out, they're actually very simple. And by having to explain that to people who can only understand simple concepts, then you, you get a better grasp of it yourself. So it's actually very helpful for the teachers as well. Um, remember, you also need to remember that Sunday School is training tomorrow's leaders, pastors, officers and assemblies. So it's actually a very important thing to do, you, the, um, just to give people the, the basics so that they can carry on and do the more 
important jobs and the more complex jobs that um, are needed. So the, the small boys that you can't do, get to do anything but play soccer in a lesson, they're the ones that are going give, to be giving the talks. So they maybe need to do something else besides just play soccer. I mean, probably you've all probably had those lessons where you hand a, you know, an extremely long, lengthy lesson to a, a teacher and they're in there for five minutes and then they're all out playing soccer and you think, oh, I wonder, I wonder which activity that was that I had on the list. Um, and I just want to reinforce that bit about giving the next generation a vision. We want them to have a vision as well of um, where our church is going and, and where they're going in their lives as well. Um, now, this is a question I always get asked about Sunday school. What can we do for the teachers? Because um, sometimes one of the problems people have is getting teachers to use the lessons properly. And um, one thing that I'd really like to say here is that it's really important for the teachers to have a vision as well and to, to see that what they're doing is very important. Um, and I, I love this quote, which is, if you want to build a ship, then you don't drum up men to gather wood, give orders and divide the work. Rather, you teach them to yearn for the far and endless sea. So if you've got the teachers having a vision that they really want to um, get things across to the children, then everything else will tend to follow on behind. If people are eager and willing to do things, then you'll find that the rest of it just falls into place. Um, what do teachers need to do for this? Now, there's quite a few things here. First one is to prepare. And really, preparation is um, most of the job. The, if, the more preparation you've done, the less you have to actually do on the day. Uh, so read the scriptures, collect the craft needs. But the main thing is to just think about it. I mean, some of the best lessons I've had are where Somebody's handed me a lesson on the, the Sunday night for the next week, and I've read the lesson that night, and then I've just thought about it all week. So you just think about different things that you could do. And quite often I'll think up a couple of extra activities, which, because that's my job, I end up writing them back into the lesson uh, later. Um, and they, they usually turn out really well. Um, an example would be I gave a lesson to the intermediate group, so that was uh, years three and four, and uh, it was on, it was um, on, witnessing. And I thought about witnessing, and there's actually two uh, areas for witnessing. One is telling people about God's message, but the other thing is the Gospels are actually witnesses of what happened to Jesus. So the four Gospels are told by four different people who witnessed what happened to Jesus. And I, th I thought, oh, well, I'll, I'll go somewhere with that. And what we did is we, we set up a little building site, a little crossroads with some buildings sitting there. We've got some little toy cars. And I said, and I put little people in there and I said, you're that person, you're that person. And they're all different people standing around this. And I said, OK, here comes a car and it's weaving all over the road. And here comes another car and it's going too fast. And we had them crash in the middle. And then each of the people had to tell me what they saw. But they were only allowed to tell me what they actually saw from the position they were in. And they were, they'd say things like, he was drunk and weaving all over the road. And I said, how do you know he was drunk? How do you know that bit? Because that's not a witness. And then we went through the four Gospels and we actually... Um, had a big piece of paper and we wrote down what was different about the what each of the four Gospels said differently. I'd actually worked that out beforehand so they didn't have to look it all up. But they, they had the, ended up with this big chart that showed the differences between the four Gospels. And they had a great time. It was They wanted to play with the cars a bit more and be witnesses again. But, you know, it's it's the sort of thing that you'd think of that... that I mean, there's no lesson on that now and I'll have to write one on it because um, they had such a good time. And I think one of the things we've got to remember is that the children have got to have fun. Otherwise, you know, they come out and they, you've probably all heard it. How was Sunday school? Boring. I've got, so it's, it's just thinking of things like that that we can do. Um, I still actually have to write that one up because that was actually quite a lot of fun for that. But that particular age group, it worked really well. Um, so having, and the other thing is to pray about it. I don't know how often I have been stuck for ideas for things. And if you pray about it, sometimes it'll just come to you. If you think about the lesson during the week, something will, will just come to you that'll, that'll be quite exciting and fun. Um, the other thing is communicating the vision to other teachers so that they too will be enthusiastic. Um, it's, it's really important to try and, and uh, you know, he, we all hate it. You hand out a Sunday school lesson and the person says, oh, no. You know, and you just, you've got to, bump them up and say, look, you know, this is going to be really good and, and see what you can learn from this. That's the other thing, is to... You can actually learn from teaching children. 
So you have to know, also know what you want to instill in the child. You have to know what the message of the lesson is and try and reinforce that through. So it's not just, you know, if you're out there and you give a Bible story and then they play soccer, you know, at least talk about the story while they're playing or something or make it something to do with the story. So have it, have it the message that you're trying to get across in a lesson reinforced all the way through the lesson. Um, and you can also use the message that they're learning to show the older children how to make practical changes in attitude and lifestyle to become a better Christian. Because quite often, um, with, with the younger ones, it's usually just a story. But with the older ones, quite often you've got to show them how they can apply what they're learning to their daily life. So you give them examples of what they can do with their friends and, and uh, what they can do with their family and, you know, to help mum and show people that they love them and uh, all the things that are actually um, applications of what they're learning. So it's not just theory, it's not just pie in the sky stuff, it's actually practical stuff they can do. Um, now this is what we need for the Revival Fellowship. I'm talking everywhere now. So this is what we need. We need a flexible, multi level curriculum for primary school age students that instills in them the knowledge of the Word of God, giving them the spiritual, practical skills they need to be Bible-believing Christians in today's world. Now, that's a big, long sentence, <laughs> um, but it, it sort of encompasses what I'm trying to do. Now, I use the word instills deliberately there because that word means impresses ideas, principles and teachings gradually. And that's exactly what we want to do. We can't hit them with it all at once. We can't go straight to the really hard stuff, you know, right at the beginning. We can't start the three-year-olds off with the death of Christ. You know, it's, it's a gradual process that you, you need to get through to your children. And it can be done. Um, it's just, it just needs the appropriate um, resources and tools to do it with. Now, why don't we just use some of the lessons that are already out there? There's plenty of them. Uh, there's... Oh, can't think of the names of them now, but there's, there's many streams of Sunday school that they've got out there. Um, and this is the same reason we don't attend other churches, because it's just not quite right and often not quite correct. Uh, there's a lot of iconery in the, in the lessons that I've looked at so far, so they have a lot of, you know, crucifixes and hearts and, and things. There's a lot of commercialism in them. They do Mother's Day, they do... Uh, Valentine's Day they, it's, it's, it's actually just you know sheer selling um, they have the traditions in there that we don't have so there's a lot of Easter stuff, there's, there's Christmas um, and we don't really want to dwell on that in uh, our lessons there's also inappropriate subjects I look, I, there was a preschool lesson which was on harbouring bitterness in your heart now I read this lesson and watched what the kids were doing and I thought for three-year-olds, three and four-year-olds, this is just the most inappropriate thing I've ever seen. I mean, I wouldn't even do harbouring bitters in, in your heart for um, year five and six. You might do it for... I mean, adults need it probably, but I don't see how it's any useful for children. And then all the lessons on getting Jesus in your heart for salvation, which is... It's not us, is it? It's not, not what we want to be teaching. What's wrong with the old lessons? Um, how many people here are using an old set of lessons that have been, you know, that you can tell that they're typed even from back in the... I think there's a set from uh, Adelaide that's still... There's a few sets from Adelaide that have been updated over the years, but the, the very oldest ones are still uh, around as well. Now, I mean, the Bible hasn't changed, so what's wrong with the lessons? <coughs> One of the reasons is that quite a lot of them are quite uh, stale now. They're very static. They're very... Uh, teacher standing out and then some stencils. Uh, the, the, quite a lot of the stencils have dated. I've got some that have been photocopied so many times you, can't, you almost can't read them anymore because the original always gets lost. So you end up photocopying a photocopy of a photocopy. Um, some lessons are too craft orientated. You've got a story and then a craft and that's it. There's not really much choice in there. Um, not that there's anything wrong with craft, but you don't really want it as your only option, particularly when you get the guy that plays the soccer all the time and the only option he's got is craft they're going to be out there playing soccer. Uh, some have no life application and some are not age appropriate at all. You probably know the ones, you've probably come across them yourself. There are now new teaching styles and new resources that we can use. Uh, there's also new communication methods that we can use. So we've got, uh, you know, the internet and the email. You're not going to be able to stop 
your children using them. As a matter of fact, I had, I had one of our students as a work experience student this last week. And uh, one of the things I needed her to do for me, I'm a scientist, I do medical research, and one of the things I wanted her to do for me was to find some references on the internet. And I didn't even have to tell her how to do it. You know, a year 10 student, she knew how to go onto the internet and find medical literature. So <laughs> they, know, they know more than, you know, we ever did when we were at that age. It's just, it's really, and we can use those, those um, resources. There's also things like, I mean, using computers, using DVDs, using projection like this, um, using cameras. Most cameras now have little videos in them. They can make little videos and show them off as, uh, we've, we've had one, we had a um, very funny little video that the dad actually sped it up afterwards, so it ended up something like Charlie Chaplin at the end. It was really quite funny. So these are all things that we can actually use in the lessons now. Um, from all those commercial sources, we can use some of their ideas, uh, crafts and activities. Uh, there's, these are some of the brands that I've found that have got fairly useful lessons. If you don't want to take, have to take notes on all of this, these, this presentation will be able to be downloaded from the website, from the Word That Works website, so all the information is there. Um, it's also got my email in it a couple of times. So Gospel Light, Standard, Rainbow, all these have, have books of activities which I've used in a lot of the lessons, um, which is really good because then you, you've got less to think of but it's bad, as I'll show you later, it's one of the challenges, which is a copyright issue. Um, there's also these websites that you can go to to find information, so eBible Teacher, Bible Activities, Sunday School Network, Bible Kids Fun Zone, Sunday School Resources, Teaching Little Ones, all these have good activities that you can use for Sunday School. Um, some of the, but you've got to make the decision when you look at it as to whether it's appropriate or not. And if you don't want to have to do that, I'm willing to do that for you, or you know, have people help me do that so that you know when you get the curriculum that comes from the Revival Fellowship that it's all perfectly okay for you to use and you don't have to um, go, oh, that's it's got a stained glass window with a crucifix in it. Do I really want to use that? So as far as the content of our multi-level curriculum goes, there is our primary source, the Bible. I actually went through at one stage when I was looking at doing three years of kinder, do we have... 350, 360 Bible stories in there? And the answer is yes, there's more. There's actually more than that. So there's enough to give the preschoolers and kindergarten a lesson every Sunday for four years and not double up a story once. We probably will double up stories once because some of them are a little bit more important than others, but the, the content is certainly there without us having to go anywhere else. Um, so. Our primary curriculum is a Bible with appropriate teaching resources with it. So the draft curriculum that I'm working on is, uh, has junior lessons and these from preschool to up to year two, depending on how you, your, your Sunday schools divide up, of course, because it depends on how many children you have in these classes. Um, and these are basically Bible story based. Then we've got an intermediate, which can be years two to four, depending on how your children divide up again. And these are theme-based. And what I mean by that is there might be a theme of the life of Jesus. So they do a lot of stories about his life. And, and you know, in, in a semester, they might get to know Jesus and what he was like and how he healed and how he loved and etc. cetera. Um, and then the seniors and the uh, lessons, which is year four to six, again, depending on how they divide up. And these are life application based. So, so things on how to apply what you learn in the Bible into your daily life, into your interactions with your family, your interactions with your friends, and your interaction with the world. So it's things that they need to know to cope with high school that's coming up shortly. Um, now for the juniors, the Bible story based lessons uh, are all starting off with the children being shown the book, God's book. Now, I've actually, I've actually got the Bible on my iPhone, so I have to take my Bible along and say, here's the Bible, but I'm actually going to read it from my phone because <laughs> I've, I've got everything marked in my phone now. I can bookmark all the scriptures I want. So um, it's, it's still God's book, but the books can be electronic as well. I don't know how many of you have got um, Bibles on your computers. I've got... Yeah, multiple copies of it because it's, it's 
just, you've got it everywhere. You can read it anywhere. Um, and it's to get children familiar with Bible people so they know who Moses is. They know who, you know, all the, all the famous ones, the, all the celebrities, Noah and Moses and, of course, Jesus. Uh, intermediate is where they do the theme base. So these are stories again, but they're usually stories with a message. And it's a message of healing. It's a message of love. It's a message of, of a problem solved and how to do it. Um, and it's, I mean, that's a, a bit of a twee statement, Jesus in our lives. But that's what it's for. It's to get Jesus into their lives so they can see how if they live like he lived, that's the way to do it. That's the way to be. Now, the seniors, uh, it's a bit more complicated because in seniors, we want to try and teach them Bible skills. We want to teach them where the books of the Bible are, how to look up scriptures, how the, what, what the different parts of the Bible are, how there's um, prophets in there, how there's gospels, how there's letters, and that the letters are not just written to the churches back then, they're written to us. So the idea is for the, them to get to see that. It's to teach them about salvation and meetings and why we have all the different parts of the meeting that we do. So got lessons that are on communion and a lesson on choruses so they know what praise is and why we do it, a, a lesson on prayer time. Um, they're lessons on living the way God's, God wants and these are usually on more abstract concepts such as um, hope, faith, uh, truth, to, get, to know that when, when they hear about these things so they know exactly what you're talking about. Um, I found with those that the teachers often learn just as much as the children because they've never... Because you have to try and simplify it for the children to understand, we, often we've never had that done for us too. And you go, oh, that's what that means. Classic example of that is humility. I mean, I, I, before I read the lesson, I really didn't have any idea what humility is. You know, I just really had no concept of what it really meant. And now I do. I can, and, and trying to get that across to the children, you get an even broader depth into it. And... You know, I can sum it up in a phrase now. It's humility is not thinking too much of yourself. It's not running yourself down. Humility is not thinking of yourself at all. And that was something that we got across to the children. And they were, you know, they were actually able to go and explain to their parents what humility was, which was good. It's also about... Bible relevance in the world today. So we do a bit of, I've tried to put in a bit of Bible geography so they know where Israel is, they know where Jerusalem is, they know where Egypt is, they know what happened there and also so they know what's happening there now because that's extremely important for us to know the things that are going on in the Middle East and, you know, it's actually not a good idea to actually go and visit these places just now. Um, I went over there in 1993 and uh, I was on a bus tour around and when we got to Jericho they said they said if you look out the window to the right there's Jericho but we're not stopping here and all the way along there were armed people with guns lined up all along the, the side because it was actually at that particular time owned by Palestine and Palestine were keeping the tourist buses out as well but it was okay um, now, any Sunday school curriculum is actually a work in progress, requiring feedback. And um, when I gave this presentation, uh, well, it was actually a much longer presentation to the Vision 10 in New South Wales um, a couple of years ago, um, I had a number of people who helped me and they sent me ideas and activities and they offered to help with um, uh, some of the work. Um, but the one thing that I really wanted from people, which I got from a few, was feedback on the lessons. So sample lessons that I'd given out, feedback on how they worked with the children and what things worked and what things didn't. Because that's really important so that we can keep adjusting and making it um, more relevant to uh, what works in your assemblies. So properties of an ideal lesson. Um, you, we really want to introduce the wow factor into a lesson. So the kids come away from the lessons and go, wow, that was great. I'm going to bring my friends next week. And the friends will bring their parents. And, you know, we can, it's a very sneaky way of getting visitors to a meeting. Um, so some of these would be that the lessons are fun, creative and dynamic. So not, not static with them just sitting there listening to you. Uh, but they, they're, really, they're really grabbed and they get to sort of do things which reinforce the lesson. Uh, it's got to be interesting for the teacher. There's nothing worse than having a topic that you're not interested in and the children can tell you're not interested in it and yet you, so that they'll just pick up on the way you feel about it. So it's got to be interesting for the teachers as well. It needs to be detailed. The more detail that you have in a lesson, 
the more easy it is to follow. And if all the lessons I write are too long. You can't do everything in them. But that's deliberate, and it's so you can pick and choose the things that suit you and suit your children. Um, I've had, up at the Central Coast, where, when I was up with Cathy, we had uh, one stage when I was the teacher there, we had an intermediate group that was 90% boys and juniors were 90% girls. It was just a really un uneven divide. And the boys all wanted games the whole time. And this particular group of girls, they're not all like this, but this particular group, they loved doing craft and they loved doing the colouring the stencils. They were happy to sit there all together sharing pencils and colouring stencils. Now, normally that doesn't work with, with a group of mixed children, but for this, this particular one, having a stencil worked really well. Um, they need to be age appropriate. There's nothing worse than having uh, children that just can't follow what you're doing. Uh, they can't, you know, putting a, a puzzle that requires children to be able to read in front of children that haven't learned to read yet. It, it just doesn't work. So we, we're very careful about making them age appropriate. Uh, they need to be well balanced. So it's not just all sitting down writing stuff. It's getting up and doing something active. It's um, listening sometimes, talking other times, so that you've got a full range of different activities in there. They need to be integrated. And what I mean by this is that all the activities that you do within the lesson reinforce the message. It's got to be, it's really important for it to be an integrated lesson. An example of this one would be where we did uh, uh, Gideon and the soldiers coming along where they had to blow horns and then the, oh, un, unfold the torches and then blow horns. All we did was make a simple cardboard tube in the craft, which they then used to act out the lesson. And inside the tube there was some, um, what's it called, cellophane, which they pulled out to make the flames when they had to be a, and we actually had little torches in some of them too, which was, um, that was when there was only six kids. If you've got more than that, it's a bit harder. But <laughs> uh, that was, and that, that was really fun because they, the craft they then used for the, uh, after they'd heard the story, they made the craft and then they used it to act out the drama. And they went through and did it over and over again. I want to turn it lapping at the water. I want to be the one that runs away, you know. It's like the, doing the, the prodigal son. I had one lesson with the prodigal son with that group of boys and they all wanted to be the pigs. I had no sons and no father. I just had this big <laughs> block of pigs that... that... Yeah. Um, also, they have to be versatile. So you have to be able to change them around as, as you need them. And that's for the teacher as well, because some, some teachers can't do craft. Um, some teachers can't do drama. Some teachers like me can't do music. So if you've got a music thing in there, um, which requires the teacher to have a guitar or, or play bongos or something, you know, it's, it's, it's not gonna be something everybody picks. Some teachers will love it. Some teachers it will be really good for them, but others it won't. So it's gotta be versatile, both for the teachers and the children. And it has to be flexible. Some people, I mean, if we're looking at doing a curriculum for everybody, some people have got a really small Sunday school room where they have to be quiet. Others have got big Sunday school room, far removed, so it doesn't make, matter how much noise they make. And my, my lessons tend to be noisy, and I've gotten into trouble for that a number of times. Some people have got an oval that they can go out and they can do really big activities. And I actually am trying to incorporate big activities into some of them. In Noah's Ark, we've actually got the older kids going out there and measuring an arc on the oval. So they go out there with the tape measures and they put posts in and they actually... And, then, and you say to them, well, where are the elephants going to go? And they say, here. And you say, it's a metre square. How are you going to fit two elephants in a metre square? So they've got to actually work it out, the logistics of fitting animals in an ark. And that was a, a really good activity. Matter of fact, they didn't want to come in. They were still out nearly for the whole lunchtime designing, <laughs> designing the ark and fitting animals in left, right and centre. I think one, one time they did it, they actually had three levels of... They had, like, a floor plan with this is the ground floor, this is the first floor, this is... A, yeah with a void for where the giraffe's necks comes up. And it got complex, I tell you, it got complex. I think one of the kids' fathers must have been an architect or something. Um, and they have to be independent. Now, this is something that a lot of the old lessons don't have. The lessons aren't standalone. Now, and the reason that I'm saying this is because often you have visitors, so this is the only one they see. If you've got a part three of a lesson coming in where they've got half-finished crafts coming through from previous ones, then those people are going to feel very left out. Um, also, you may have children who are only there every second week or every third week because they're, uh, you know, they're with one mum or dad one week, so they're not there all the time, or they're with grandparents sometimes. 
and they feel left out if there's continuing lessons. So I find it really important to make them all quite independent so that you don't have to pick something up or, or leave something half finished, which is equally as irritating for them. So it, uh, under fun, creative and dynamic, children are very harsh but honest critics. And a lot of the things that I've changed come because I go up to children after lessons and I say, what did you do and did you, did you enjoy it? Was it fun? And I'll show you some of the comments I get from that later. They're very honest, very honest. Um, we want the children to be excited to attend and still excited afterwards. So we want them to race out to get there, which most of them do, um, but we want them to still be excited about it and to go back in and say, Mum, Mum, look what I did, or look what I made, or... I mean, we have them coming in and doing little skits that they've designed at the, the end afterwards, so we want them to be excited about it. The more excited they are, the more they'll remember. That's important. Um, we want them to say, hey, guess what we did in Sunday school today? And we want them to say that to their friends at school, so they bring them along next time. So maybe our non... Revival Fellowship friends want to come along. We've got a couple of little girls that bring their friends from school and they, they obviously like it because they come back time and time again. We want the lessons to be stimulating, make them think. We want them to be a bit, a bit challenging, so not necessarily uh, something that they feel like they've done before. We want them to be progressive, so we want them to be constantly learning new things all the time. And not just the same stuff each week. I mean, one of those um, uh, commercial ones that came up, I sort of looked at the first lesson, I thought, this is really great. It's got a feeling, it's got a maze, it's got this game to play. Then I went to the next one and it had a feeling, a maze and a game. And the next one had a feeling, a maze and a game. And I thought, no, nah, it's not gonna, not gonna work every week. So sometimes the fun of a story is how it's told. So, transported to a surreal landscape, a young girl kills the first woman she meets and then teams up with three complete strangers to kill again. Okay, the story of the Wizard of Oz. Oz. Now, that one doesn't sound real good to tell kids, does it, that version. Uh, so, it, it's how you tell the story. And so, in our earlier ones where we have Bible stories, if you can use props, if you can get one of the young guys to tell it in a really exciting way. Sometimes we get the young youngsters in to, to make it really, really exciting for them. And one thing to remember about this is what people hear, they forget, what they see, they remember, and what they actually do, they understand. So that's why we try and make the seeing, the hearing, and the doing all be on the topic so that it all reinforces each other and they come away and they go, I know exactly what happened. Now, that doesn't always work. I had a four-year-old girl and I, after we'd done, we'd done Jonah and the big fish and we actually had uh, a fish made out of the chairs and tables and a bedspread in there and they all had to swim into the fish and, and uh, get eaten by the fish and then, you know, it was all play acting. And I said to her afterwards, so who got eaten by the big fish? And she said, I did. So she could remember, she could remember. Her. And I have to put a graph in because I'm a scientist, sorry. And this actually reinforces what I want to say because I've made a visual representation of the message. Uh, if you talk, they will remember 10% of the information. If you have just a picture, they will remember 35% of the information. If you have a talk about it and have a picture, like I have right here, and then if I get this and go, see, 65, 35, 10, see this here? You're not supposed to do this, it's supposed to make you seasick. See, look, hey. now you'll all, all remember that. I'll probably come up to you on Monday and say, what were those numbers again? <laughs> you'll have it right in your head. So you learn better by seeing and doing than just listening. Now, the Bible, this is where our stories come from. It's actually phenomenal history. There's so many things that happen within it. We know it's the greatest story ever told. It's full of the supernatural. I mean, you, know, you could actually point that out to the kids. I mean, they had the sun stand still, for heaven's sake. They had an axe head float. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of weird things that go on in the Bible. It's passionate. There's an awful lot of passion in the Bible. It's emotive. There's a, an awful lot of very emotive stories in the Bible. Um, maybe not for the young ones. We don't tell them about the ten peg through the head, but, you know, it does have that sort of thing. It's, um, it's very dramatic. It's very dramatic. And as one of the boys put it, it's full of heroes and villains and swords and shields and stuff. You know, that was, 
That's, that's their view of the Bible. They like the excitement part of it. And we can use that. We can just keep that excitement in there and use those stories. Now, making it interesting for the teacher, this involves having the lesson supplied early enough. As I said, if you, now, early enough, but not too early. Have you ever tried to give out a lesson a month in advance and then they've forgotten where the lesson is, let alone that they had to do it? I mean, it, it happens all the time. We found that one week works really well and if you have to give it out two weeks before because they're not going uh, they're not going to come for the next week, you've got to remind them. You've got to remind them a week before and you've got to remind them two or three days before and often you have to send them another copy. <laughs> That's what I've found anyway. Uh, so it does require a little bit of work. It needs the research on the topic done for them. I mean, most people don't have the time to spend on it and the more, the more information and time that that you give to the um, people beforehand, the more likely they are to do it in the way that you want them to do it. So the research done for them, and as I said, detail, detail, and more detail. Everything they need. Here's a list of the, the craft things that you'll need to do this particular item. Here's how long this will take if you do it with 10 kids. You know, as much information as possible. Um, as I said, the supplies required listed, um, and it needs to have a list of different activities a variety of activities so that the teachers can pick and choose which one they need to, they feel they're capable of doing. So you've got, you've got the kids' capabilities there, but you've also got the teachers' capabilities. It has to be something that they can, they can do themselves. And that's a comment I've had from different teachers where they say, oh, not another crossword. We did, last time I did this, we had a crossword. So, um, the detail means less strain on the teacher. And also, that includes ideas of how to use the craft activities games to reinforce the topic. So as I said, with the trumpet and the flame, actually doing a, a drama with it, we've done it where we've made little fold-out uh, storyboards where the, you go through the story again afterwards and they have to open the storyboard at the correct time so that the, you know, the, the red sea parts and the people can walk through or, or whichever one it happens to be. That was the last storyboard I made. <laughs> that one. Um, have an aim written in the story. This is the aim, this is the message we want you to get across in this in this lesson, um, and instructions on how to get that uh, message across. So the skills and requirements of different age groups. This there's a lot of things involved here, and this is research I've done to try and make uh, the lessons age appropriate. So children have got different cog cognitive skills depending on how old they are, and that's how their thoughts are processed, how they can think through things. And some, obviously the older children can do that a lot better than the younger children. The younger children often can't do, do it at all. They can't see how to apply a lesson. You can't say to them, um, look, if Jesus healed this person, that means you can be healed as well. But quite often that's even too hard for them to, to follow through. Motor skills, obviously. The, Older ones are better at it than the younger ones, and you don't want the you don't want the younger ones having to try and do things that they're actually not capable of. The ability to interact both between the student and the teacher and between the children. Some children, the older children, could do teamwork things. The younger ones, they really can't. If you've ever watched junior soccer players, where the older ones actually hit, kick it to each other, and the younger ones, it's like a pack following the ball. The one at the front kicks it and the ball goes and it's just this little, little five-year-old playing soccer. It's, um, they don't understand teamwork yet. And it's also about how much basic Bible knowledge they've got. So that obviously starts at nothing and works up to quite a lot by the time they're in senior. Now, this is probably too small for you to see all of. Can you read that? Oh, okay, yep. What actual age group are you? Okay. Right, so preschool is, well, it's it sort of worked on, on where they are as far as school goes. So preschool is any of the children that haven't attended school yet, regardless of what age they are. So if they haven't started school, then they're in this group where some of them can colour, but they can't, there's no reading and writing whatsoever. So you can't give them a worksheet to do because there's absolutely no reading and writing. They'll sit and still and listen to stories, but only for a short time. And they obviously can't discuss stuff. You can't, you can't have a back and forth discussion about things because they, they don't understand what you're trying to do. Um, so these, these sort of activities are suitable for them. So kindergarten and year, year one, and perhaps some of year two, so that'd be uh, from age five to about 
seven, five to seven year olds, um, and they they are starting to learn to read and write, but they can't really do it well enough to like they can't read the Bible. They can't. They know some words, but they and quite often with them you can have really simple worksheets that are circle the word that means this. Even those might be too hard for them. Um, then there's the ones that can read or write. Uh, and they can remember simple scriptures, but they're really not up to discussing uh, stuff in any depth. So it's got to be a very simple message still. So is that the 8 to 10? Uh, yeah, about eight, eight, 7 to 9 even, say. And then the last group is like 9 to 11. These all overlap too. You'll notice they all overlap because it depends how you've got to divide your, your stu students up. And it will change year to year. That's the other thing that's thrown me out a number of times. Sometimes I've had senior students on intermediate lessons because the senior lessons are too hard for them. They're just not as, they they're just at, happen to be an active group that don't want to sit and discuss. So I've put them back on intermediate lessons because it suits their, their energy level better than the discussion ones. Other times we've had um, older, more mature students in the, in the years, in years five and six, and we've actually put the year seven students back in because they want to discuss some of these concepts and they want to learn how to use their Bibles, um, et cetera. So it's, it's every class and every child is different. So it's a matter of working out what your children are like and what their skills are. And that's why these all overlap and they're all slightly different. And just to show you how I divided these up, that's the group that we've got in junior. So that's the ones that would do the Bible stories. These ones are in the senior. And then the intermediate group tends to move around and encompass those ones in the middle, but sometimes it might include the kindergarten and sometimes it moves down and includes the year four. Just depend. It depends also on how many children you want. You want to try and have fairly equal class numbers. You don't want to have two in one class and 20 in the other. So you tend to um, move the boundaries around a bit to match the children that you've got and also their skill level. And you'll know if they don't understand the lesson, it's too hard, you might have to drop them back to an earlier, uh, to, like if in senior, drop them back to intermediate. And I've had to do that a number of times. Quite often I change at least one of the classes after they've done the first few lessons of a year because it just turns out not to be suitable. And that's where the flexibility comes in. You've got to have those lessons available so that you can say, okay, these are obviously too hard, they're not getting it, they can't do it, let's make go back to an easier year. And that's why I want them to be flexible so that you can do that for your, your students. It's, they're not all going to be the same. That's why sometimes scripting things and making it all the same and you all have to do this one here and you all have to do this one here and you know, it'd be me like saying, okay, you're all going to start these lessons right now here and we're all going to do the same lesson every week. It's not going to work. It's, it, you have to be flexible with these things. Um, so is that clear? Can everybody sort of follow that? You'll be able to get this from the, the internet, this, this page. That's just, a, and that's just sort of a basic guideline to go by. Is it, is it, the age is different at the schools in Queensland, are they? Okay. Okay, so just a bit on the, on the variety. These are the sort of things that you try and have in each lesson. Um, Bible stories, choruses, prayer, testimonies, craft, games, drama, they love drama, puzzles, art, skits. Uh, by art, I mean you actually go to a large, you know, you go to a big blank piece of paper and you make them do something on it like we did for the uh, witnessing lesson. Skits, they can design themselves. We've had them do their own Write, rewrite this Bible story in modern day. We had one the other day, it ended up being in a, an orange juice bar or something, and it was, some, I must admit, I didn't actually get it in the end, but the kids got it. Um, puppets, snacks, music, and discussion. So there's lots of things that you can do in a lesson to give the variety in there. And I try and have five or six of these in each lesson, and you pick the ones that suit you and the children. Um, integrated and that's just reinforcing that idea that the story, the theme, the talk and the activities uh, reinforce each other and get across the message. And I've got C sample lessons there, but you'll be able to see it in the lessons. If you, what I'm going to do is get you to email me and if you want some a sample lessons for each year or even a, a term's worth of lessons, I can photocopy them and give them to you. We want them to be versatile so you can be used them in different ways, whether you have individual group teams or classes. 
cater for all the primary education uh, levels and cater for all assemblies, regardless of demographics, regardless of how, how big your assembly is, how fast your assembly is growing, the age of your assembly. We've got assemblies with no children yet, but there's going to be. Um, and also where you are. I don't have any activities with snow, but then I'm in Sydney, so we don't ever have that. So you might have one in yours. Um, independent lessons, so that's so they stand alone because of the visitors that don't uh, attend every week. Um, and that it can be very distressing for them, especially if they come back and somebody smashed the craft. We had that happen one time. They'd actually loaded some chairs in on top of half-finished crafts and the children were just devastated that their half-finished craft had been smashed. Um, and also, if they're independent, you can change the order of them and be flexible with them. So if you've given a lesson out and they say, look, I can't come this week, but I can, come, I can do it next week, and you can give out another lesson, it doesn't matter that they've switched around. And I find that really uh, useful. So here's some of the comments from the children. More games, less craft. That was boys. Um, that was a class that was 80% boys. Enough of this craft, more games. Uh, that was also boys, more food. Um, more treasure hunts, that was all of them. Um, I often do them a treasure hunt where they've got to, they've got to um, find a scripture which gives them a clue, which gives them, tells them where the next item to find is. And you do it sort of all over the area that you've got available outside, inside, um, but not so they're running past the, the back door of the meeting too often. Um, which has been a problem. Um, go somewhere different. So not always have the lesson in the same place. If there's a spot out under a shady tree or somewhere where you can have a lesson, uh, particularly if it's on nature or something, so that they're somewhere different for a change. And this was boys also. Less teacher talking. They were just a bit upset at being preached at, I think. So it was um, teacher talking less, us doing more. Now, how many lessons is this? <laughs> if I do, if I try and get together three years of junior because you actually got them there for three or four years, uh, three years of intermediate, two, at least two years of senior, at 40 lessons a year, it's 320 plus lessons, and I've got six activities, try and get six activities in each. I only need 2,000 activities, so if any of you have got any ideas, I want to send them to you. Um, and just to give you an idea how far I've got with this, it's actually, I have a good first draft of 57%. I worked it out the other day, I went and added them all up. So I've actually got a good, I'm calling them all draft because I'd still like to, you know, add more and revamp and do more things. I, I'm very low on musical activities because I'm not musical. So <laughs> I need someone to come up with those ideas and put them in uh, for me. So it's more than half done. There really is a first draft that's more than half done. Um, but if you want any of these lessons, I'm more than happy to send them to you for you to try out in your assembly. I just say, please, 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 can you give me feedback on them? And if you have a scathingly brilliant idea uh, that you on any of the particular topics, if you can send me a note or even better, write it out as, a, as an A4 sheet complete with formatting and diagrams all over it and pictures of how you did. No, you don't have to go that hard. But if you write, give me a note on, on how you, you did it, um, that'd be just absolutely fabulous because then I can just say, great, this goes with this one and I can just slot it in. I just, I'd love to be able to do that. Now, we're running out of time, but I've got to tell you about some of the challenges that we've got. These include, I'll go into these in a little bit more detail, but it includes copyright issues, security issues, uh, the small and growing assemblies, and uh, Sunday school, using Sunday school as an outreach. And then there's the added thing about the holiday activities that I don't know whether you guys, we don't run lessons all year, we stop the school holidays and give them activities. So that's another issue again. Uh, this is the biggest problem that we often face and that's apathy, where you can't get people to get excited enough about it to, to put the work in to make it exciting for the children. Um, and the reason I wrote Leave the 99 for the one is because I've actually had somebody say to me, oh, we don't do anything for our one year six child. He, d he stays in the meeting because there's only one of them, we can't be bothered. And I <laughs> tried not to get angry, but I did. But um, I mean, that child is just as important as all the other children that are there. And they, even if once a month they get a lesson for them, that, that would be something. And the work volume involved, that's a big challenge. Uh, and that's why I, I'm here asking for help. Now, the copyright issues are really important. All, a lot of these activities we're doing, we, we need them rewritten, redrawn. Uh, 
or we need to research whether some of these uh, companies such as Gospel Light and Standard will let us use their work in other lessons. Because as they stand now, I can photocopy them and give them to you because we're all in the same church, but I cannot put them up on the web. I cannot scan them in and put them up on the web because that breaches copyright. That's why people who, who want lessons, I'm really happy to give them out, but I post them to you. If you scan them in, I mean, I've got the capability, we've got a photocopier that will scan and email it to me, but I've breached copyright as soon as I do that, and we cannot break the law. It's not in our best interest at all. Um, so that, that is a big problem, and I actually had some people who were rewriting, uh, slowly rewriting things for me and giving them a different name. Gonna have to go soon. Uh, security issues, and you do look at this carefully, because uh, there are rules on uh, who is allowed to look after your children by law. They're different for each state. So you have to look up a state relevant site. If you go to that uh, Care for Kids site, that will tell you um, what you have to do. At the present, there are no legal requirements for ACT in Northern Territory in Tasmania. In New South Wales, you have to sign a prohibited employment declaration. The other states, you actually have to get a blue card. So. You may or may not know about it, but each assembly must do it so that you've, everybody's covered correctly by law. Uh, and the other security issues are things like signing in and out children. It probably only matters for a large assembly that you're aware that you're in charge of all the children that are under your care during that lesson time and they can't wander out into the car park and et cetera. Um, and then apathy, you, you probably all know that and I'm not sure what we do about that, but uh, we need to be able to communicate the vision to the teacher. Uh, so that's the sort of work volume that I'm looking at and you can help by contributing lessons, ideas and activities that you know work, telling me how they went. Um, and I'm sort of trying to do all the rest but if anybody's interested in helping with, with any of those, I'd love it. <laughs>